Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, I am um, uh, Hannah Riley Bowles. I'm the research director here at the Women in Public Policy Program, where we are committed to closing gender gaps in the area of economic participation, political opportunity, health, and education. Thank you for joining us for our first seminar of the year. I hope we'll see you back. We've um, had very rich um, conversations that progress um, over the course of the year, so I think there's real, there's real benefit into being a regular participant, and we're delighted to see you all. Um, our first speaker is um, a very special friend of the Women in Public Policy program. Um, she, we, we can actually claim a former faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School um, before she was swept into New York and then eventually um, captured by the Harvard Business School. Um, Robin is a, a very important scholar but truly a thought leader on issues of gender and uh, uh, workforce diversity, making diversity work in organizations um, more broadly. But she isn't only an important thought leader, she's actually been um, the intellectual architect and an important leader in the change that's been going on in recent years um, with Dean and Noria at Harvard Business School, really trying to enhance gender equality and inclusion more broadly at the business school. So it is a particular delight to have her here today. She is going to present a paper that I've seen in early form and was so great then and I'm excited to see now on a work family narrative as a social defense and this will get you talking coming out of the seminar <laughs> explaining the persistence of gender inequality in organizations so welcome Rob thank you it's, it's really a pleasure to be back here it's been many many years I um, started my academic career here when it used to be called um, KSG, yeah. <laughs> um, in 1989, um, and then I left in 95. Um, so the work that I'm going to present today is um, co-authored with uh, Irene Padovic, a sociologist at Florida State, and Erin Reed, who is a former doctoral student of ours at HBS, who's now at BU. Um, and the problem that we're addressing in this paper is women's stalled advancement. So I'm going to just share some statistics that probably come up at every talk that you um, attend if it has anything to do with um, uh, private sector business. So we know that um, it's been, you know, it, this is the kind of catalyst pyramid. Um, as we move from the bottom of organizations to the top, we see fewer and fewer women. Um, and uh, what I really want to focus on here is how that number hasn't really changed. And I just, I picked out 2002 because the number was actually um, higher then. Uh, it's not like it's going down necessarily, but it hasn't really changed. And in professional service firms, and that's the domain that I'm going to be, um, or, or the, uh, the setting that I'll be talking about today, um, women, while women are about half of associates, and they have been for quite a long time, they're still only about 15% um, of partners. So. Um, I'm going to go right into the research setting uh, because the first research question really came from, uh, it was one that the, that the organization itself posed to us. Um, and I'm going to present that research question and what we learned when we went into the organization to investigate. Um, but then uh, we, I'm going to add to the data set um, as we went through the process of um, collecting the data, feeding back the data. Uh, we went back and uh, reanalyzed under with another research question. So the first research question is um, kind of preliminary, but at any rate, it was a mid-sized global consulting firm, um, and uh, ooh, I hope this is the right version because I had said U.S. Um, somewhere, maybe it's later. Um, okay, so men are overrepresented in the senior rank, so it's, it's structured um, fairly typically, although maybe even a little bit more dominated than most of these organizations. And um, when they came to talk to me, they had. Uh, reported that they had sort of done all the obvious things to try to change um, the demographics here, to try to move more women into the partnership. So they had generous maternity leaves, they had work family accommodation policies, and they had networking groups and a whole variety of other things, what they called low-hanging fruit. And so they came to me um, with uh, the question about how my, perhaps the culture of the organization might be impeding women's advancement. So this is something that um, a lot of us have written about, how. Um, how the culture of organizations may be part of the problem here. And so that's 
I think partly why they came to me. When I say culture, I'm going to use this sort of technical definition here. It's the way we do things around here. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, there are more technical definitions, but this is one that crops up over and over even in the academic literature. So it just gives you a sense of generally what I'm talking about when I say culture. And the reason that we're looking at culture is because it is the site of what we call second generation um, forms of gender bias. This is uh, this, th these forms of gender bias have been written a lot about um, by m many of my colleagues. These are the kind of invisible, inadvertent, um, uh, uh, invisible barriers that arise inadvertently in the course of every, you know, undertaking work every day. Um, so that was our orienting uh, research question. I'll tell you a little bit about the method. Um, so we, I'm, I'm going to present an analysis of interviews with 107 women and men from all the professional ranks. Here's the US. OK, good. I've got the right slide deck. Um, and so there were really three studies that we've combined um, for this data set. So study one is what I'm calling the firm culture study. And that was the study that the firm asked us to come in and do. I quite frankly didn't think I was going to learn much from the question that they had about their culture because we've studied that a lot. I've studied a lot of professional service firms and I didn't think there was going to be anything that interesting theoretically, um, but I was interested in getting access to the firm for some other research. So Irene and I, Irene Padovic and I, were doing a, we wanted to launch a study on gender and leadership identity and my doctoral student, then doctoral student Erin Reed was thinking about doing her dissertation on men's professional identity so we got access for her and that was kind of the exchange. Um, so altogether 107 interviews uh, and you can see again across the basically the professional ranks of associates and partners and men and women. Um, so uh, the, because we were combining data sets we looked across at some of the questions that were relevant um, to the research question that we were asking. And um, we, were, we had asked questions about, uh, across these studies, about you know, what do you think it takes to be successful at the firm? And are there any particular challenges that you see women facing? Um, we asked them, could they explain why um, women were advancing at a slower rate than men? Sort of what were their um, hypotheses or theories about that? And um, for those who are participating in the tandem studies, that is the study of men's um, professional identity and the study of gender and leadership identity, we also asked for their personal accounts of um, who they were in their roles. Um, how did they take up those roles? How did they think of themselves as professionals, as men, as women? And then we asked about particular challenges they might personally have faced. So we're getting both kind of their, their, um, their narrative about what's going on in the firm, but then also their own personal experiences. So I'm going to go right into the findings. So um, yes. Can you just give us a, like a little bit of background on what led the firm to you? Did, did they approach you to be a consultant? Did they approach you yeah. to, to figure out how to tap on how, uh, sort of uh, uh, underutilized resources that could make them more effective? Were they trying to just be good citizens? Um, the person who approached me was actually a senior woman partner, mm -hmm. and she approached me on behalf of the women's networking group, the, mm -hmm. the women's leadership mm -hmm. organization. Um, and she had read my work and um, had shared it with some of the other um, senior women in that group. And then they went to the managing director and said, um, you know, we've kind of gone as far as we can go. We think we need something a little bit deeper. We think there's something in our culture. And, um, and we think we probably can't see it because we're in it. So we'd like to bring someone in from the outside. And so that was how that conversation started. And I initially said I didn't really want to do it <laughs> because I was not that interested in the question, actually. But then with this sort of quid pro quo of getting more data for the research questions that, that we wanted to address, um, they were happy to do that, especially because our research questions they could see would very much um, produce data that would be relevant to the question that they had, um, and uh, so yeah, so that so that was that was kind of how that that happened. And I think the I think the managing director was um, kind of in hindsight. I think he was very concerned about the unhappiness of these senior women who were very highly respected, um, and I think they had a very good relationship with him. And it seemed that he really was very on board with the study and so that also was a kind of impetus like actually maybe they would undertake some change and so that was that was also a motivation for us and then in terms of the consulting piece 
So they paid for the time of uh, a research team to come in and do the interviews, and um, not a whole lot, but you know there was there was some exchange uh, there, but but really the investment for us was in kind of the full the full data and with the permission to use the data and with the proviso that we um, disguise them obviously, which is what I wanted to do, so that there would be kind of you know. They don't have that. They don't own the data. We owned the data and all of that kind of stuff. So. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, so the firm's explanation. So now I'm getting into the findings. And again, these are kind of the preliminary findings. This is, this is backdrop to the next research question. That is the real research question that I want to focus on today. Okay. So the firm's explanation um, for women's stalled advancement is what we call um, the work family narrative. And the work family narrative has two. Um, plot elements. So it begins with um, descriptions of a job that demands excessively long hours and frequent travel. So as is the case in professional service firms, generally um, hours at this firm are grueling. One consultant told us um, there's a correlation between success and the willingness to just put everything else aside and do a ton of work. So um, weekly hours averaged about 60 to 65, although a lot of people talked about working closer to 70 or 80 hours a week um, on occasion, uh, and um, according to one interviewee. So I'm going to be reading some of the data rather than putting it up here, so I'm going to be kind of going back and forth here. So one interviewee said along these lines, um, people here are probably doing 14, 15 hours of work a day, pretty much just working and sleeping during the week. They sleep six hours a night or less. Your ability to get by on little sleep is a necessary skill set. So the conflict between work and sleep was a pervasive theme and I think really points out the, um, <coughs> the sort of um, sheer raw demands of the work. A senior associate told us, um, we're on our blackberries, so this is a little bit dated. <laughs> um, we're thinking about our work 24-7. I mean, maybe you tune out for a little while here and there, but people at this firm work all the time, all the time. You wake up at night, you're dreaming about it. The first thing you do when you wake up is you pick up your Blackberry. So we didn't hear any disagreement about this across people that we um, interviewed. Um, so now we get to plot element number two, and that is that women's family responsibilities, but not men's, conflict with the time demands of the job, and that's why women are not advancing. So when we asked why women weren't advancing in the firm, the partners indicated work family issues, and this account filtered down through the ranks. So according to one partner, we have great intentions and I think pure intentions, genuine intentions about getting the best involved regardless of gender, race, creed, religion, what have you. I frame it the following way. What do I want people to worry about when they wake up first thing in the morning? For business development people, I want them to worry about business development. For project managers, I want them to worry about the project. Women are the project manager in the home, so it's hard for them to spend the time, to spend the necessary time, energy, and effort to be viewed here as senior leaders. It's about believability. If I'm a leader and folks know that I'm not there for them, that I'm offline for significant periods of time, they don't believe I'm their leader. Another person was equally matter of fact about this. Uh, and said, my observation is that in most families, even two career families, women to take, tend to take on disproportionately more responsibility for kids. So I think in those situations, it's particular di particularly difficult for women to do any professional work. So that was from partners. <laughs> oh my God. That's from partners, but the associates concurred. So according to one male associate, the conflicting requirements of, of motherhood in the job meant that women can't handle the fast track. And he said, it's just basic math, right? So you take 100 people, 50 are women and 50 are men. 25 of the women are going to have kids and not want to work. 25 of the women are going to have kids and might want to work but don't want to travel every week and live the lifestyle that consulting requires of 60 or 70 hours a week. So we thought this was interesting since in his calculation, out of the 50 women, all of them have children, <laughs> and none of them is able to e meet the responsibilities of the job. So this is kind of an extreme version of this pervasive um, storyline that basically mo motherhood renders women inadequate to the task and explains their relative 
lack of success. What I also like, we call that the 50-50 guy. Um, <laughs> that, was an, that was an interview that, um, that Aaron did, and at the end of the interview, she asked him how many hours a week he worked, and he said 50. <laughs> Very interesting. And by the way, he was not part-time, because a lot of the women who go part-time, and it is primarily women who do go part-time, um, they're working 40 or 50 hours mm. a week at part-time. So by and large, the women associates also agreed with the work family narrative. And according to one mother, she says, um, there's no overt sexism. Once you've proved yourself, people work with you. No, no one would hold me back from being on a hardcore partner track if I were willing to work 70 hours a week and get on a plane every week. The issue is that women are choosing to have kids and be their primary caregiver. And then from a single, a, ch a, a single childless um, woman says, do women face particular challenges here? Not because they're women, but because their laundry list is longer than men's. So with very slight uh, variation, the analysis was the same, firm-wide. It's women's um, typically great, greater domestic responsibilities that are impeding their ability to perform a job that requires long hours. And the, so the problem focus is firmly on women who are seen as less willing or less able uh, than men to compromise um, their family commitments. Okay. So this um, explanation that they offered squares with, I think, the dominant cultural explanation. We, s we hear a lot about opting out, and um, I think we first uh, heard that in this cover story by Lisa Belkin that came out in 2003, cover of the New York Times Magazine. Women leave the workplace more easily than men and find other parts of life more fulfilling. They don't want to do what it takes to get to the top. And actually, at least our alumni concur um, in a recent survey that we did of um, our alumni, people, men and women who have graduated over the last 50 years from Harvard Business School, we gave them 14 factors that might be, um, that might be uh, explanations for um, women's stalled advancement. And the number one uh, reason, not the number one sort of statement that people agreed with was that women prioritize family over work. So this is a pretty pervasive theme, and it's something that we, so seeing it in this firm wasn't all that surprising. Um, what was interesting, though, is that there uh, was some contradictory evidence to the work family narrative. Um, so we started noticing some disconnects between what the firm was saying and then what we were seeing in some of our other data. So the first disconnect was that, women, that men were at least as likely as women to say that work interfered with uh, family. So according to one of our men, he says, last year was hard with my 105 flights. I was feeling pretty fried. I've missed too much of my kids' lives. According to another, I was traveling three days a week and seeing my children once or twice a week for 45 minutes before they went to bed. Saturday came and I couldn't go to my son's soccer game. He burst into tears. I wanted to quit then and there. So this is just, I'm t p picking out two, but there were a number of um, men who made uh, these kinds of statements. So contrary to the work family narrative, it seems like men are also dissatisfied with the strain that the long hours places on their families. So the other thing that was interesting was that we looked at turnover rates for men and women. <coughs> and interestingly, it was when they came to us to talk about the problem that they were experiencing, one of the pieces of data that they put forward was a disproportionate turnover rate um, for women. <coughs> but when we actually looked at the data for the previous three years, <coughs> we found that there was no statistically significant difference in the turnover rates for men and women. <coughs> it seemed like a very odd um, disconnect. So the, so the pyramid that you describe, or the discrepancy that you describe, is all about promotion rather than voluntary departure? Um, so this is a firm that doesn't have an up or out uh, policy. And so um, I think the pyramid is, I, it doesn't seem like women are leaving at a faster rate. Um, and it seems more like partly what's happening is when they are acquiring other firms, um, they're uh, sometimes actually acquire women partners and don't put them in the partnership. And so they're bringing in more men disproportionate to women. And then when women do take accommodations, they step off the track. So they're still in the firm, but they're not actually on the partner track. So there are a variety of things going on inside the firm that are making it, um, that are keeping that pyramid. But in this firm, it doesn't seem to be disproportionate turnover. I'm not suggesting at all that this is 
come, and I think that many firms do experience disproportionate turnover. What was just interesting to us was the disconnect between what they had said originally and then when we looked at the data. So, um, so the interviews seemed to confirm that at least some of the turnover for men, as for women, um, was uh, work-family conflict. According to a father of three, he says, I wouldn't characterize myself as unhappy. It's more overworked and underfamily. If I were a betting man, I'd bet that a year from now, I'm working somewhere else. And a year later, he was. So the fact that men, um, especially fathers, suffered from sort of work's intrusion into their family lives and quit at the same rate, we thought called into question the veracity of the work family narrative as an explanation. So. Um, we offered our feed. Yes. Uh, just going back to the contradictory evidence, my recollection is that the studies show that when women leave a firm, even if they're viewed and their own narrative that they've provided is that they're leaving for family reasons, within two years they're employed at another firm. Yes. And yeah. that two years is the outlier number that mm -hmm. most it's faster. Mm -hmm. So that as a society, people use the cultural narrative as a tool. Yes, they do. So even though the HBS alumni data may confirm the narrative, it's really confirming a socially acceptable narrative yeah. rather than a factual event which is taking place. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And and I think you're studying, you're, you're um, probably referring at least, uh, you know, to the Deloitte study where they, no, there was a disproportionate turnover uh, among women and then when they went and interviewed them and they had all said they were leaving for work family reasons and something like 70% of them were employed full time almost immediately and like, Another 20% were about to go back to work, and so we're talking like 10% who yes. left for that reason. Yeah, I think that's right. It's interesting in the alumni data, it was um, actually 80, 82% of women who um, cited that women prioritize family over work, and 74% of men. So, so I think women are both embracing it as an explanation and, and also using it, and not necessarily um, as a you know, so, so I think there's, it's kind of interesting what's going on there. Um, okay, so, so we had been brought in to do this cultural analysis, so that's what we did, and we um, gave our feedback to the firm, and we offered an alternative analysis to the work-family narrative, um, and we suggested that these unnecessarily, that there were unnecessarily long work hours and a culture of overwork that hurt all employees. Um, so, it kind of it came out in um, a few different uh, dynamics. One that we call overselling. So um, this is this is an employee who is um, talking about the, the the problem of overselling, and he says some some partners promise the client the moon without even thinking about what it means for their team. We'll give you X, Y, and Z, and we'll do it all in half the time you think it should take. Sure, says the client. Sign me up. So that's the kind of overselling, uh, not, not charging enough for their for what they're delivering, which causes them to work these long hours. So the culture also valorized over delivery, priding itself on delivering 110% to clients and offering smart solutions to clients' problems. Associates went along with over delivery and overwork partly to stand out as stars in a pool of highly qualified people. So as one person said, we do these crazy, t we do these crazy slide decks that take hours and hours of work. It's this attitude of, I'm going to kill the client with a hundred slide deck. But the client can't use all that. People do it so others on the team will see that they're smart. Um, so I have a lot more data on this, but again, this is, this is more backdrop. Yeah. So do you think that that differs from, uh, from uh, other no. firms that you haven't studied but you've talked to a lot? So could, is your guess is if you studied McKinsey or BCG, et cetera, et cetera, that it would be the same? conclusion that you would reach? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily overselling per se, but I think that there's, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. By, I mean, in other words, they probably charge a sufficient amount, but uh, nevertheless, it seemed like there are a lot of dynamics that put people into an overwork situation that isn't necessarily about the work per se, but is more about managing an impression or, you know, living up to what it means to be a consultant, you have to be working these hours. So that, that's my guess. What do you think? <laughs> um, I think that the data would be the same. And, 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 but you're, all, you're also are, are coming up with a conclusion 
sort of unnecessarily long. Um, and there are people at the top who would say this is working really, really well. Yes. It's an enormously profitable. Firm. I actually had a um, conversation with the um, CEO of a large law firm in New York <laughs> mm -hmm. who was came to me with the same problem, just biggest problem on his list. Can't promote women, can't figure out what to do about it. We had a conversation and I suggested a number of things he might want to look at and how to think about this. And, and then at one point I, I asked him, so do you think that you waste time? Do you think you waste much time? Oh, we waste a ton of time. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, so see, I mean, I think actually if you took a look at that, you might see that you don't really need to work all those hours. And he said, oh, but then we wouldn't have the billable hours. Mm -hmm. Like, just said it. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. So, um, so we gave this feedback uh, to the firm, and they rejected it because it didn't focus on women. So we couldn't figure out why we were coming and talking to them about men when the problem was with women. Um, so it was interesting that they had actually requested this type of analysis, and when we gave it to them, it, it didn't confirm what they thought they knew, um, and I would say, when I say they, I'm really talking about the managing director. I think the women partners who were in the room when we were giving the feedback were like totally into it, really got it, thought it was really interesting. But interestingly, when they went to do a presentation of the work that they had done over the year to the full partnership, which actually I was supposed to, they wanted me to give, I couldn't it because I was teaching. And so they said, oh, well, we're just going to do it ourselves. And um, so they did the presentation, and then they showed me the, 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 the slide deck that they used, and it was like, wow. I mean, they totally didn't represent what I know they had understood of the analysis when we presented it. So I thought that was also really interesting. And I talked to them about it, and they're like, oh, yeah, we forgot about that part. <laughs> so I do think that there was, even in their minds, as they were anticipating talking to this largely male full partnership, that they're kind of imagining what it what can they say, what can be heard, and in the process perhaps, you know, um, forgot or, you know, didn't, didn't put together the full analysis. So they retained their original assessment and basically that was pretty much the end of our engagement um, with them. Okay, so... Um, so before you move on. Yeah. Um, does, did some of that stuff go towards the gender differences? I, I didn't really connect the overselling and things like that with what was leading to the proportion of the remainder of the Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's a great question. I actually, I should put this in here. So so one of the things that happens, and it's going to come up later when I, in, the pre in some of the other data I present, but one of the things that happens is um, there's a disproportionate impact of this sort of overwork <coughs> on men versus women, in part because of the sort of cu on cultural, sorry, yeah, on women versus men, yeah. So it's um, the long hours are more disadvantageous for women for a variety of reasons. One of them is that when women encounter overwork, there's a kind of built-in culturally acceptable thing to do, which is to go part-time and to ratchet back, whereas men are less likely to do that. So, so this culture of overwork, which was everyone was suffering from, they were not responding to it in the same way. And so I'm going to get, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I also have somewhat of a macro question before you go into your next question. And that is, is that a reaction that you experience a lot when working with organizations? I meaning that at the end of the day, they're like, oh, confirmation bias. You disconfirmed my, what I believed, and therefore your study can't be right. Oh, and I mean, an even more profound question, because I'm sure that's a big question for you, and you even talked about that at the beginning. When you think about which organizations to work with, mm -hmm. there's a lot of organizations which like, you know, to work with you, and then you're trying to um, diagnose who's ready and sincere, and mm -hmm. here, the conditions weren't bad. It seemed like in yeah. the beginning, in exactly. the management, the director thought, I'm, this would be a problem, I'm really committed, right. I, I like my colleagues, and then, and then it didn't work out. So my question is twofold, is does it happen a lot? And do you have a diagnostic <laughs> that you're using? It has happened a number of times to me. I can't say a lot because mm -hmm. I've stopped doing that work. <laughs> uh, for that reason, it happened to me more earlier in my career. Uh -huh. But it happens a few times, and you start, you know, you start to try to read the 
signals. You know, where, where, you know, is there going to really be support for the kind of work that they're coming to me that they want to undertake? And I haven't, and so I thought this would be a place, um, but it wasn't. And I, I don't think that that's true in every place, but I, it, I would say it is a theme. And hard to predict ex ante. Well, I have some thoughts about that, actually, uh -huh. and so we could talk. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to learn, I think, uh -huh. maybe. Uh -huh. um, but yeah. So, and I do think it has a lot to do with leadership. Um, but it's even with really strong leadership support and commitment, um, I think there are a variety of things that make it difficult to stay the course. Mm -hmm. That's probably another talk. <laughs> yes. Hi. I'm sorry. Um, do you, did you ever think about maybe crossing? those information of the people that you interview with their performance evaluation mm -hmm. and see if there were a discrepancy there? Yes, so um, actually Erin did that in her um, dissertation research and hopefully we'll have a paper forthcoming very soon where she, I believe, through the revision process, still is able to keep the performance data in there. Um, and um, the punchline on that for her, she's looking at question of whether men in fact enact the identity of an ideal worker, somebody who's available 24-7. Um, and she finds that there is, of course, variability on that. Um, she has some men who do enact it. She calls them supermen. She has men who look like they're enacting it. Um, they pass in, a, in certain ways, um, but they're not actually enacting it. And then there are those who reject it for writing of reasons. And what she shows is that the performance act is actually not different between the super the, the, the supermen who are actually enacting it and the ones who look like they're enacting it. And then the performance um, of the men who are not enacting it in some obvious ways um, are lower. I don't she, know that's she presented in our seminar last year. Oh, OK. So yeah. That, yeah. yeah, so some of you were. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. very good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so this led us to the research question, why does the work-family conflict, why does work-family conflict persist as the dominant explanation for women's stalled advancement? And um, so we went back to our data, we observed these disconnects, um, and uh, we went back to coding the data. We did a <coughs> conventional content analysis coding where we took at face value what people were saying. But we also did um, what we're now calling an inferential coding scheme, I'd love any feedback, thoughts you have about that, we haven't submitted this paper yet, um, where we tracked the emotional content of the responses and we were looking for patterns um, as participants were hesitating or contradicting themselves or, you know, starting a down one path and then switching to another, that kind of thing, revising things that they were saying. And we thought that that was um, potentially uh, evidence of something emotional going on but that was difficult to talk about. Okay, so, uh, so that led us to a psychodynamic systems perspective to help us make sense of our data. So I'm going to take you a little foray into psychodynamic systems for um, a few minutes and then I'll get back to the data. So this is our emergent hypothesis. Um, the narrative and associated policies and practices operate as a social defense, I'll define that, by fulfilling the psychodynamic need of the collective to fend off anxieties that are raised by a 24-7 work culture that denies the fundamental human gratifications of a life infused with both love and work. So love being the stand-in for family there. Okay, so um, social defenses defined. So we're taking this from a paper by um, GP and Jen Petriglieri. They say social defenses are collective <coughs> arrangements such as an organizational structure, work method, we added policy or practice, or prevalent discourse created or used by an organization's members as a protection against disturbing affect derived from external threats, internal conflicts, or the nature of their work. I'm going to unpack this. So the nature, and let me go backwards. So the nature of their work, we're saying, is the 24-7 work culture. The disturbing affect is ambivalence or guilt, and I will give you a sense of what that, how that manifests itself slightly differently for men and women. Um, the prevalent discourse is the work-family narrative. The policies are work-family accommodations, um, and the practice is that mostly women take them. Okay, 
so the prevalent discourse, the policy, and the practice, that's the social defense. So I just want to remind you, a social defense is something that exists at the organizational level on behalf of the collective. Okay. So now for the psychological mechanisms. Splitting projection and projective identification. So I'm going to give you some definitions here, tell you a little bit about how we think this was manifesting for men and women, or how it does manifest in general, and um, and then I'm going to give you a personal example that I hope will bring it home for you. Um, so uh, these are unconscious processes. We don't normally talk about unconscious processes. It's very difficult to study un unconscious processes. But that's what we're trying to do in this paper, and we're trying to do it empirically. So, um, so these mechanisms are continuous unconscious defense against an intolerable intrapsychic experience. It consists of splitting off the intolerable aspects of the intrapsychic ex experience and projecting those aspects onto another. Then maintaining empathy, what's called projectively identifying with what's been projected out by unconsciously inducing those aspects in the other person. It doesn't need to make total sense yet. Okay, but here's how it works. It can work between two people. It can work between two groups. So here we're suggesting that this is working at the intergroup level. So each gender takes key parts of the whole person and splits them into a committed parent and a committed worker. I'm not suggesting that all people are parents, but you know this is the kind of the stand-in for that part of our lives that is about love or connection or that kind of thing. So committed parent and a committed worker. Women are assigned and take on the role of the committed parent. Men are assigned and take on the role of the committed worker. And then men and women support each other in taking and keeping these assigned roles, and together they constitute a whole. Okay, so let me just give you a personal example. Sometimes people have found this helpful when I get to this slide. So um, some of you know my husband because he was actually working here at the Kennedy School. When, this is where we met. So I have a, a fondness in my heart uh, for the Kennedy School. Um, so, um, so when we met, he had been married before, and he had two children, and um, he had had a vasectomy. And so he had made a decision that he wasn't going to have any more children. But I had never been married. I thought I did want to have children. Um, and so this was, but we, when we got together, and uh, we decided to get married. We didn't resolve this issue about whether or not we were going to have children. Um, but it turns out that you can have vasectomies reversed. Um, and if you do it within 10 years of the vasectomy, the chances of, the su chances of success are actually fairly high. So we went into the marriage with this kind of between us as a difference. And I was taking up all of the part that was about wanting to have the child. And he was taking up all of the part that was about not wanting to have a child. So that was where the conflict was. And it was quite uncomfortable and could be actually sometimes really painful. So one day, we had been married a couple of years, we were visiting a friend and they had small children. And um, for the weekend, we woke up in the morning and my husband turned to me and he said, you know, I really think I could imagine doing this again. And all of a sudden, it welled up in me, this feeling of, oh, I'm not so sure I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a really, and we looked at each other, and because we both know this sort of, um, these concepts, we're like, oh my god, we're splitting, we're projecting. This is what's happening. <laughs> Um, and I think that what we both felt fundamentally was ambivalent. It's very difficult to hold on to an ambivalent feeling because what are you going to do with it? It's telling you to go um, in the direction of A and in the direction of not A. It's contradictory. And so you split off one side, and if somebody else can carry it for you and express it for you, your anxiety goes down. So it's not that it's a comfortable experience, and it's not that we don't have, we didn't have zero access to our ambivalence. But it was the system that we had created between us. So that's the splitting, the projection, and then the projective identification. So that we could actually have an experience. We didn't have to let go of the other side, because the other person was um, uh, expressing it for us. And so that's what we're suggesting 
is potentially going on here with the work family narrative um, that it's supporting, along with a number of other things, this splitting between men and women where women take on the kind of the commitment to family, men take on the commitment to work, and um, they need each other to do that because in this culture, this 24-7 work culture, they can't hold on to the two things simultaneously and feel they have to give one up. So they need the other group to enact it for them. Um, this is a hypothesis. I am not going to test this hypothesis. Um, I am going to present data to illustrate uh, uh, how this might play out. And, um, and, and it's basically a kind of a theoretical frame on the data. So there is a but here, because as I said, it's, uh, it sort of works. <laughs> but it's not entirely comfortable. So this resolution of the long work hours problem only happens at the collective level, and at the individual psychological level, the wholeness is illusory. So you have to keep resubscribing to the, the structures that, that enable you to hold on to um, the splitting and the projection, and it, and it provides this illusion of wholeness. So you, you're, 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 you're blocking from any um, conscious understanding the discomfort that you have of having given up one part of your life. Um, but that uh, personal sense of relief is fleeting, so our claim here, the work family narrative is a collective psychopathological response <coughs> to the loss of fundamental aspects of one's humanity. Um, so, um, let's see. I'm going to take you through what this, how this, what this looks like for um, men and women in a 24-7 work culture, and then I'm going to actually go deep uh, into the men's side of the story. And then if I have time, I'll summarize what it looks like for women. We'll see where we are with the time. Yeah. Is 24-7 cult work culture, is that synonymous with we expect the person to get the stuff done? Or mm, not really. So, so those are different. So 24-7 so. means availability rather than just getting stuff done. Yeah, and I think there is a bit of a conflation <coughs> between the getting stuff done and availability, there's a belief that to get stuff done, That's you must be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what, what strikes me is that you're framing this as a 24 7 culture, and yet what you have there is just traditional. And so I wonder whether that in a 24 7 work culture is, is necessary. I mean, this, this dualism yeah. has been held historically. I know. And it's much more. Uh, it, it's much more common throughout history than than what we sort of have as some ideal. Yeah. So so I wonder, um, in some sense, whether this is about the twenty four seven work culture, or it's about the fact that this ideal, this dualism, is hitting up against actually a growing discomfort with the dualism. So, so you're framing it as if we're, you know, we're, you know, trying to create this, um, and it seems that it sits there, and what's happening because of women's desire for availability, changing norms, et cetera, yeah. you know, medical, historical yeah. things going on, that this is becoming less and less tenable in families and organizations and in society. Well, I think it's becoming less tenable for the reason you describe, but also because there has been a worldwide speed up. So yes. I think the two things are happening at the same time. And I think that's what's sort of colliding and, and creating all the um, sort of angst about it. Um, because I think there's always been the splitting. I think that's what you're saying, right? There's always been a work family split, gender split. So you're suggesting that if somehow we didn't have this 24 seven, women could just comfortably go into the workplace and no. Not exactly. Not exactly. So it's unclear that the twenty four seven is the cause of is the causal thing. I think it's a common I think it's I, I think it's all these things coming together yeah. and, and manifesting in a particular kind of narrative at this moment in time. And um, and and not just the narrative, but a set of policies and practices and beliefs that are supporting it, that are are needing to be uh, even more strongly erected in order to keep this thing going because we do have so many women entering the workplace. So, okay. yeah. One, one piece of comparative work that might help get that is um, 
and I've just learned about this from Aaron, haven't read it directly, but the research that's done on um, working class versus yeah. um, fathers, fathers in nine to five, or I shouldn't call it working class, but fathers in more nine to five mm -hmm. um, structured type of work yeah. versus extreme work yeah. and the types of parenting roles that they engage mm -hmm. in and how they conceptualize their parenting. Whereas like, so supposedly the guys in the elite jobs are more likely to, sh they, they like show up for performances mm -hmm. where the guys yeah. who are in more structured work coach the team, yeah. you know, and yeah. so it would be, maybe that's a space to sort of look at whether or not within the same age yeah. if you have less power yeah, that's constraints, interesting. whether you have less need to hand over the entire role to the other person yeah. in terms of parenting. Yeah, it may also just be overdetermined. I'm it it sure. could be overdetermined yeah. by hours, but yeah. it's just a... Or just by the culture of, yeah, I don't, because I don't I mean, there, There's plenty of gender roles yeah. within people who are on fixed yeah, yeah. hours. No, yeah. That's not the issue. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The, ex the extremity of the projection yeah. might be as yeah. important to look at. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, okay, so let me just take you through this so that I can get into some more data. Um, so, we know the cultural exemplar for women is being the ideal mother, my family is all important, and work identities are expendable. The internal conflict, in particular for ambitious women, is that these work identities are compelling the feelings are ambivalence about long work hours, and for women, it's guilt about violating the, um, the female gender role, which is as the caretaker. So for men, um, the cultural exemplar is the ideal worker. So my job is all important, and non-work identities are expendable. The internal conflict is that non-work identities are compelling. Um, and let me just give you another quote here. According to one man, he says, I definitely want my daughter rely on, relying on me. But she's asking her mama, or she's asking her mama put me to bed, asking her mama give me a bath. It's because she knows that she can be relied on. Um, so uh, I think his sense of guilt is pretty palpable there, and the guilt is about not violating the male gender role of breadwinner. So then enter the social defense. Okay, so here is an illustration. I'm going to take you through two illustrations from two different men, and then if we have time, I will give you an overview of what this looks like for women. But I think it's really fascinating for the men. Uh, it's actually it's interesting for both. So, um, so here is one man's narrative that we interpret as an example of how the work family narrative operates as a social defense. So we asked him if he'd seen women encounter different different challenges. That was the interview question. This is one of Aaron's interviews. And he says, I believe deeply in my heart and soul that women encounter different challenges. There's the collusion of the society that it's the woman who takes the extended maternity leave. And there are some biological imperatives too. When my first child was born, I got to carry her from the delivery room to the nursery. It's almost like I could feel the chemicals releasing in my brain. I fell so chemically, deeply in love with my daughter. I couldn't imagine a world without her. I mean, here it is in just the first eight minutes of her life. So I can understand, how can I possibly give this up and go back to work? But back to work he went, and his takeaway understanding was that women face problems with work family. So he could be said, from the standpoint of a defense analysis, to be splitting off his deep connection to his daughter, splitting, uh, projecting it onto women in the firm, and then projectively identifying with the emotional gratification that they experience as mothers. If he relinquishes that feeling of connection to his daughter, he doesn't have any reason to feel sad or guilty about returning to work. So unpacking the components of what he says here, it helps to clarify, I think, the defensive process. Um, the narrative sort of s flows rather smoothly, but it's illusory. So let's track what happens to the intensity of his feelings of attachment to his daughter. The first two sentences make a distinction between women and men and, a link, and link um, biology to motherhood. So it's women and not men who have the parenting experience. Then he says almost the exact opposite by abruptly shifting to his own biologically framed intense emotional experience of parenting. So in doing this, he's momentarily taking back the projection he's just placed on mothers. His 
act of understanding women's experience via his own, however, signals that projective identification has occurred. He's in effect saying, I was having this experience, but it was transient. And now that I've sampled it, now that I've been a tourist in this emotional land, I now have a way to understand what's happening to women in the firm. So the powerful emotional experience with all the psychobiological force that he described is no longer his. Now it's theirs. He knows it, but he's not governed by it. So in fact, he immediately um, shifts in his next statement. So this is the narrative keeps going. Um, to aligning himself not with women but with men and explaining how men are different from women. He says, I can't think of a single instance where the fella took a six-month paternity leave to care for the baby while mom went back to work. And then he speculates vaguely about the way the firm works and he says, I think we have a way of problem solving and a way of engaging with clients that doesn't necessarily give a greater advantage to cowboy style or a kind of the certainty that seems to be a social aspect of masculinity in North America, but it's clear to me there are, clarent, there are clients who like that certainty. And then he concludes by situating himself squarely in the male-dominated world of work. He says, you know, kind of like the work I do in the beer world. It's dominated by men, and I mean men, slapping each other on the back and talking about golf and shit like that. So he ends up by placing himself where he began, in a world that's different from women's, in, a world, in the world of work, the beer world, where men and masculinity dominate. This is a world where there's no room for, emotional, for the emotional experience of parenting, and here he's able to exist, however unhappily, because by the way, this guy is not happy. He is a partner. Um, unencumbered by these different challenges um, that he ascribed to women in his opening statement. So this is an example of how the work family narrative operates as a social defense through men's projective identification with women in the firm. So this guy is drawing on his understanding of women in the firm to um, achieve the resolution, but more typically, men drew on their understanding of their wives, blurring the distinction between women and ultimately consigning them to the private sphere. So we call this privatizing women co-workers. So for psychodynamic um, purposes, the firm's women become privatized and thus are made indistinguishable from wives. And here's a man engaging in this process as he explains women's lack of advancement in the firm. Consulting can be a bit more difficult for women. There's a lot of travel. Um, it's, uh, it's my personal, what I've seen, sometimes women are more attached to kids. They feel guilty with my wife. Sometimes they feel guilty if they're taking time away from home in a way that men don't. You do, a lot, you, you do travel a lot, you do work longer hours, so some men don't feel certain things that women do. So this is one of these places where we saw lots of <laughs> and we thought, okay, what's going on here? Let's try and unpack it. So here's what we came up with. Okay, so first of all, we know how, in trying to talk about the difficulties of the firm that, that the firm's women face, um, consulting can be a bit more difficult for women, he needs to invoke his personal, shortly revealed to be his wife, in um, a representative of the private sphere. Uh, we then see him moving back and forth in a fragmentary way uh, between women in the private and public spheres of his life, his women co-workers and his wife, after invoking his personal, he returns to his, uh, uh, let's see, he returns to um, co-workers. They're more attached to kids and they feel guilty. He goes back momentarily to his wife, with my wife, and then reverts back again to women co-workers' guilt, a guilt that men don't feel, and then he reasserts what it takes to do the job, which is long hours. So in psychologically consigning the women to the private sphere, he's paving the way for splitting and projection that appears at the end of the passage that women carry the guilt associated with work and men don't. Yeah. So in this particular instance, um, my, um, I'm thinking about is, is this person married to someone who is also in the workforce? Or is this a woman who is outside of the workforce in her predominant role is taking care of children because then there might be more of a of an emotional connection to separating yourself from your kids yeah then if you're already in the workforce and you separate from yourself from your child every day 
So he's 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 making a connection um, from a family situation that might not be relevant for the other for his coworkers who are women. Um, yes, I think that's true. I don't remember whether his spouse is um, what her kind of employment status is, and the spouses of the men that we interviewed had could have had a number of different kinds of arrangements over time that they were reflecting on. Okay. Um, so I don't remember, because actually this was a, um, I think this was Aaron's interview, okay. uh, I think, and I don't remember what his situation was. But I, but I think that, that that's right. I mean, there's they have all sorts of personal arrangements, and then there is at least what we think we're seeing here yeah. as a kind of you know, projection onto women in the firm. Yeah. Ron, interestingly, in these narratives, each of the narratives essentializes the woman worker to mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even women in the workforce who do have children, and obviously we know there are many women in the workforce who don't have children, mm -hmm. even women who do have children are only in mothering years, and let's for the moment like forget the fact that there are men who parent, mm -hmm. but have mothering years, and then years usually preceding that, mm -hmm. and years after that. Mm -hmm. The narrative freeze frames this archetype. Yes. And what I was interested in is, do the interviews, is it just these are the ones you chose because they're illustrative of the point and help us get through the slides and mm -hmm. understand what you're saying, or was that a consistent narrative? The, these, are narr these are men's narratives Correct. about women. Correct. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, did you also find people who discussed their women co-workers not essentialized into mother? Yeah, sure. But when they were talking about the challenges that women face, it was always essentialized. Uh, well, or I can't say it was always. I, I would say this was a strong theme. Yeah. yeah, this was a strong theme. So, just to quickly summarize: men are displacing personal needs and feelings onto women. This allows them to, you know, to to be the ideal workers that they're expected to be, to um, uh, to meet the organizational imperative for profit-maximizing workers. The work family narrative helps to alleviate some of the pain of the loss of the domestic, but these defenses aren't uniformly effective and men still are grasping for psychic integration, which is part of the process um, in theory. So um, let me just quickly go back to, uh, to, to women. So you've seen this slide before, and just to highlight here, so for women, um, the cultural exemplar is as, is as the ideal mother, the internal conflict again, for ambitious women in particular, is that work identities are compelling, and the feeling is guilt about violating the female gender role. So then the social defense. So what does the social defense look like for women? And I'm going to just wrap up here, um, and I'm not going to present the data. Um, but it operates a little <coughs> bit differently for women. Um, and we thought, we thought that what we saw in the data were some additional elements of the social defense. Um, so there are a variety of ways in which the organization is constantly reminding women that they're in the wrong place by being at work instead of home. So we identify three push factors. These would be part of the social defense. Women have to withstand these push factors in order to hold on to their work identity. One thing that's interestingly not parallel about the men and women in this firm is that these women had not actually left, right? So the splitting and projection and projective identification is all happening in the workplace, whereas men are actually living out as workers and not at home, um, that, that, that entire splitting. What women have done, it seems, is really interjecting the mother identity, but not necessarily fully projecting out the worker identity role and having a lot of ambivalence about that. So um, as I mentioned before, work family accommodations could be seen as part of the social defense. These give women a ready off-ramp from the path of overwork. So at a certain point in one's career, um, especially in the associateship, it becomes very, very difficult um, to manage the hours. It's just the way the work is structured. It actually gets a little bit better when they get promoted to partner, although they don't necessarily realize that. Um, and so when women hit a bump in the road, there's this easy, it's like, oh, of course, you got a baby, you have children, you know, you want to have children, so you're going to ratchet back. When men hit a bump in the road, so what Erin shows in some of her data is actually they just go underground and they do workarounds and they create a little bit of um, more of a semblance of 
of, of work family balance for themselves, but they don't do it publicly. Okay, so work family accommodations could be seen as part of the social defense. There's also a narrative that we found very interesting that women lack what it takes to be superstars. And that is um, competence in selling, in particular to CEOs. So that, I think, diminishes their sense of efficacy on the job. So both men and women talked about um, you know, the, the sort of the exemplar of person who's able to sell to CEOs. This was the managing director, very much a, a, a masculine man engaged in a variety of masculine behaviors. We have some great quotes on that. And then women saying, um, I'm not really sure I have what it takes. I'm really relational. You know, like I go in there and I want to be friends, and I've been told, basically, you know, you can't do that. CEOs don't really want to be your friend. Um, so the last piece is maybe women partners could have represented to women lower down in the organization that actually is possible to be uh, an effective mother and you know, to combine sort of motherhood and being a worker. These women partners, interestingly, were very highly respected by and large. Um, they were seen as very competent. They weren't always likable. So you see the competence likability trade-off happening there. And, um, and virtually all of them were mothers uh, with relatively young children. Um, but there was a whole narrative about how success at work for these women implies bad mothering. So lots of narratives about how they were really bad mothers. When I read the data, I don't really see the story as particularly suggesting that they were bad mothers. I don't know if they were or they weren't. But when I hear the evidence that gets put forward by both men and women, I wonder about it. So like a woman partner, one woman associate was saying, you know, I, I don't want to be anything like they're terrible role models, you know, I just can't stay here because I want to be a mother and I want to be a good mother and they're terrible. And was um, uh, on the phone with a woman partner as she was going to pick up her son at school. And when the son got in the car, she could tell on the phone that the son had gotten in the car and the mother didn't even say hello to him. And, and this young woman thought this was just horrible. And I was thinking, wow, when I go pick up my daughter at school, she's usually, by the way, he did have the vasectomy <laughs> 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 We have an 18, lovely 18-year-old daughter. Um, but um, <laughs> it all worked out. Uh, but, um, but, you know, when I would pick her up at school, and she's plugged in. She's, a, she's got her own life going on. You know, like, not to say hello to her is not really the worst thing you can do as a mother. But I think that a lot of... Mm -hmm. um, you know, younger women who, who actually don't have children or aren't around children, they don't quite really, they create these stories, I guess is what I'm suggesting. So there is a narrative, true or not, I wonder about how true it is, that if you do become successful, you cannot possibly be a good mother. So I think that's another kind of push, um, push factor. Um, so I don't think to go into all this. I'm going to, I think I'm going to end there. I'm not going to recap because I want to leave. I think you kind of get the idea. So, um, so that's the paper, and I'd love to hear any thoughts or more questions. Yes. That was really fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, you said that uh, social defenses are at the organizational level. I'm puzzled because the, the defenses that you describe are psychological defenses. How do you get from that psychological level to the organizational level? Okay. And call defenses organizational as well. It's a great question. It's partly why I, I wanted to highlight that about a social defense. So there's the social defense which by definition it's social, it's at the collective level. And then there are the psychological mechanisms that operate together with the social defense. So there's something going on at the individual level, actually at the intergroup level, and at the collective level. So it's really a multi-level phenomenon. So the social defense at the organizational level is actually the policies? The policies, the narrative, the narrative. all of the stuff that gets, that is at, that's shared, so a shared narrative, yes. um, uh, um, collective behavior, the fact that they had these work family policies, but it was predominantly women who took them. So that's, you know, and something that's viewed and interpreted in a particular way. So that's the, that's the, that's what, en that's what um, enables uh, 
sort of gives legitimacy to this, this and supports and reinforces the splitting and the projection and the projective identification. So do you have a hunch of what the relationship then is between the psychological mechanisms and the organizational um, mechanisms? So I'm going back to some of the, you know, sort of old, when I was first introduced to the idea of a social defense, um, it was uh, some work that was done in a hospital setting uh, by Isabel Menzies and, um, and what uh, she was brought in because of some dysfunctions in the way that the nurses were delivering their care, if I'm remembering correctly. And, um, and they had, uh, what they had what she noticed is that they were engaging in a variety of practices and norms. The way that they did their work was actually undermining their effectiveness, and yet they were doing it and they were committed to doing it. And she, what she showed was the reason they were committed to doing it in this, what seemed like a legitimate way, but that was ultimately undermining is because it actually was, it was a set of practices that wasn't actually put in place to facilitate the work, it was put in place to defend against the anxiety. And so that's kind of the fundamental mechanism of a social defense. I think psychologically the way it manifests here is around this splitting and projection and projective identification. You don't have to have splitting, projection, and projective identification be the psychological manifestation of a social defense, but that's what, I, that's what we thought we saw here. Is that helpful? Yeah, so you're basically saying well, you kind of collectively decide in, a, in an unconscious way to do your job in a certain way um, in order to be able to manage the anxiety that arises sometimes from the very nature of the work itself. And what she showed, it was a lot of the anxiety about just dealing with people who are dying. And so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I was just curious about I don't have a good answer to that. I, I think I know what some things not to do, but let me just, I did have a few thoughts about um, what could be a next step. Uh, because I don't think that this is really a, a, I think this is not a conventionally testable theory, although I have thought about ways to even bring certain aspects of what we're suggesting goes on here into the lab to study it. Um, but at an organizational level, it seems to me that one way to test the hypothesis is to, in a kind of conventional sort of action research way, to think about, okay, if we think this is what's going on, what, what do we think would disrupt it? What kind of an intervention? And so kind of a theoretically driven intervention. And then, you know, if you could implement that intervention, then see if what the theory would suggest happens actually happens, and that might be support for the theory. Um, so what would those interventions be? These are probably not going to be very satisfying to you because they're not <laughs> very specific. Um, but for women, I think it's about creating context that support their ambition, so that's the work side, without requiring them to split off their relational side. And I think for men, it's about creating context that support their relational needs without diminishing them as men. Um, I think, you know, when I listen to Leslie Perlow talk about her work, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but with her work, but she has this book called um, Sleeping With Your Smartphone. And, um, and what she does is, she's an ethnographer and she goes into organizations and she's very interested in how people use time. Uh, and so she did a study of um, what, BCG, Bain, I can't remember, it's public anyway, whatever, uh, consulting firm, very similar to, to this one. Um, and she was interested in, um, in seeing if, if uh, she could, um, uh, create interventions that would give people more relief from work and more personal time. And um, so it's a really interesting story that she tells in her book about how she did this. And the resistance she got, because, oh, you can't change anything, basically. She finally gets an underperforming team to agree to be a guinea pig, which is <coughs> not really what you want when you're trying to, you know, <laughs> test an idea. You want, you know, you kind of want um, a, 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 a better circumstance. But, um, but at any rate, um, she had them uh, 
the intervention that she had them do was to take uh, one predictable night off a week. It turns out that there were all kinds of positive um, effects of having done that. Um, first of all, they said it was impossible that they finally did take one predictable night off a week. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of change in, in, you know, in terms of how much they're working. But at any rate, um, what I found really interesting about that, though, is that um, what she uh, describes as being really responsible for the positive outcomes, both in terms of like client satisfaction and, and she did this across many teams afterwards, and lots of different kinds of interventions like that, um, client increased client satisfaction and um, and sort of better sort of work life balance. Um, and she was not looking at gender, and she doesn't really doesn't want to call the work she does. She doesn't want to put it in the domain of gender. I think precisely for reasons that we would understand. Um, based on this analysis, but, um, but what she um, thought was probably had the biggest impact was that people were talking to each other about their personal lives um, on these teams, where they had been all work, 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 and now they actually had to, because they had to fill in for each other, somebody had to be on call, it meant not just women were talking about their personal lives, but actually men, it was required. And so they actually engaged each other in a deeper way um, and she thinks that that had something to do with it. So I think maybe some kind of intervention like that. Yeah. So I, I, I want to try something very different that's yeah. probably not very psychodynamic because they don't have the skills. But I'm thinking about amazingly successful women who my best guess are really good uh, moms as well. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that 24-7 is inviolable for them. Okay. And certainly, and the image of women uh, of successful professionals can't be good moms. That's that's, yeah. that's kind of a ridiculous right. statement as a law. Mm -hmm. um, and but but there are people. And I'm going back to an earlier comment. They get stuff done. Yeah. So I so if a professional service firm didn't sort of present itself as we work 24/7, but we get stuff done. Yeah. Is that is that more? Female inclusive, which which is kind of a, a yeah. nice image. We get we get stuff done. We get stuff done on time. Um, how we do it? That's kind of yeah. You, you shouldn't be so concerned about whether we work at three a.m. or not. Yeah. So it's interesting. There's a um, Aaron. Um, um, you read? No. Yeah. Sociologist. I'm getting one of those. Aaron Kelly. Thank you. Um, Erin Kelly and some of her colleagues have uh, studied an intervention like that at Best Buy, um, and the intervention is called ROW, R-O-W-E, and I can't remember. Results only. Results only work. Some. So, um, and that's really what it was about. It was, it was about saying, um, we, we, we don't care where or when or how long you work, you just need to produce results. And, um, and they undertook this for a long time. They studied it, uh, and they looked at the outcomes. There were not differential outcomes by men and women. This was, again, it was one of these, not about gender, but about changing the work culture. That was really important to them because they were afraid that if it became something about you know, workplace flexibility, it would only be women. So it was really uniformly um, implemented across the board. And they had a lot of very f positive results from it. Um, among other things, increased work-family balance and more satisfaction across the board. For some reason, um, Best Buy dropped the program. And um, when I asked them about that, uh, she and Phyllis Mullen, they didn't really know why. So what was going on with Best Buy now? And it may have been around um, that time. But, but would you endorse that as an answer to the the prior question from the woman in the back in terms of a policy recommendation? So I think, um, I mean, what's interesting about that is that they also have a paper, Erin Kelly, in Gender and Society, where they talk about how nevertheless, even though this was supposed to be gender neutral and the effects were actually um, the same for men and women, there was a lot of gender narrative around the take up and the implementation of the program, because they had to spend a lot of time in meetings, and they, they were present in these meetings and observed them. Um, and uh, so it was still very gendered. So I, um, I think that it could help, but I, I, I think there is something about challenging the gender narrative explicitly and having people, I, this is what I kind of like about what Leslie did, is that 
it was a subtle challenge to the gender narrative because it required men to talk about their personal lives and their whether it was their kids and they weren't all married, but whatever it was, it just kind of brought that part of themselves into the workplace. And I think that's probably important for disrupting what we're seeing here. Does that make sense? In general, I think in my own work around, as we have tried to make change um, in the culture of organizations to um, increase basically social justice uh, um, outcomes, whether gender or race or whatever. Um, it's, I, what I think I've learned from my research is you need to make change in the organization, but you also need to make discussable how those changes are going to be influencing the various groups in the organization. I tried to do this work at the body shop a long time ago. It was one of the, my first forays into this. And, and, and you couldn't have had, I mean, Anita Roddick, head of the organization, she was you know, very um, ardent, uh, vocal, feminist. Um, she couldn't get women into her senior leadership team. And so she came to Deb Meyerson, who again came to me. And she was like, what am I, I don't get it. I, need some help here. So that was a great invitation and we did some work there and we worked in a manufacturing plant and we worked in headquarters and we tried to make these changes. And our thought at the time was, look, it doesn't really matter whether, like in the manufacturing firm, whether the changes that we are, you know, working with them to implement, because they, they were sort of like gender, whatever. We want to make these changes. We want some help, you know, making ourselves more efficient. So we're, so we're thinking, okay, if you change this aspect of the way you organize your workers on the line, Given what we know about how gender manifests itself here, we think that that's going to actually end up creating more gender equity. And so we call it, they lost the gender narrative, and we said, well, maybe that's okay, because you know we think we're right about our diagnosis. Turns out it's not. Turns out they, they made these changes, and they made things even better for men. <laughs> so the work, you know, the, the, the work practice changes that were to enhance the way that they were working and to make them more effective, more efficient, whatever, they didn't have any effect on women because that practice just got taken in by the culture of the organization. It was, it was co-opted by the culture of the organization and just became yet a, another better way for men to get ahead. So I think that there's the culture change, the practices need to change, and I think there needs to be a narrative that goes along with it about how you're also trying to change some um, inequities. In the well, I mean, you were and I think it's just a very yeah. small yeah. moment, but I mean, I'm also I was very impressed by Leslie's work, and I think similar to you, it had I, I had these two reflections. One is kind of sometimes force is needed. You have to force these people didn't want to take the night off. Yeah. You need to force people to do something. And that reminds me of Sweden, mm -hmm. you know, enforced parental leaves for fathers. Or mm -hmm. if it's not forceful, it's a huge incentive to take it. Um, and the second thing that I took away from her work is deeply behavioral. Mm -hmm. And the same is true in Sweden. You're actually having to be home, having to, or having huge incentive or disincentive not to be home with your baby for three months. But what are those guys doing at home? Are they with their babies? Because I thought what was happening is that they were taking the time off and there actually hadn't been much of a change at home. So, so that's, a, that's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know they go. And I don't see, I don't think <laughs> right. that at least so far those policies have actually made a difference in terms of the proportion of women rising, at least in the private sector. In the, in the public sector, because they have quotas, stubborn. at least in Norway, you see that's where ambitious women go into yeah. Just like the, that men wrote more books when they were home with their kids rather than... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, so I, it's, it's that's tricky. not going to work for us. Um, and just one asterisk. Not alone. Sorry. Not alone. Mm. One asterisk, too, is that we're, we're talking, in essence, about an issue that absolutely loops back around to intra-household bargaining yes. on the other end without never saying it. Yes. So I just thought we should say it. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But that's the Absolutely. flip side that we're not discussing. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Well, I, I said there would be, you'd be walk out of the room talking. <laughs> uh, thank you all. I hope you'll come back next week. Uh, Lisa Vesterlund, uh, professor of economics at the University of Pittsburgh, is going to talk about this research that Iris actually presaged at our, at our um, 
a welcome event, uh, breaking the glass ceiling with uh, no gender differences and declining requests for non-promotable tasks. That is a great, That's a great by the way, I just heard it last <laughs> week, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, it does have that. Yeah. I think we should have just a prop at some point. The Morrow thing. Yeah, I, I, I see that. Alright. I'll be emailing you for a minute.